Hey everybody, Mr. Harvey here. Let's continue our lecture into chapter 16. So when we, less, when we last left off, uh, we were talking about science and some of the new scientific ideas that were really changing everything in Europe during the 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, obviously, we talked about Darwinism and how natural selection was just a game changer uh, for intellectual thought in Europe. Um, during this time, but also, you know, geology, we're going to be talking about radiation, there, there's so many scientific ideas, so many intellectual changes. Um, and that's obviously going to put our traditional intellectual institutions on the defensive and really affect them. And, you know, that's what we're going to be talking about today is Christianity. And, you know, obviously, during the 19th century, uh, uh, this was a tough time for Christianity for Christians for religious institutions. Uh, as there was there was specific ideas with evidence that were contradicting some of our traditional notions of Christian thought. You know, the the uh, Darwin's ideas concerning natural selection, evolution specifically are attacking the book of Genesis and creation of the universe. Um, the same thing with geology. It's 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 specifically, you know, attacking how the earth was created, specifically attacking the age of the earth um, that was previously noted. Um, so science is really, really, really um, making the 19th and early 20th century a very difficult time for Christians. Um, we're going to see many people leave the church. Urbanization is similarly uh, challenging and, and making it very difficult for uh, the, uh, the church education is changing which is again is making it difficult for the church so we're seeing an attack on multiple levels now it's really important to understand <clears throat> excuse me it's really important to understand ladies and gentlemen that just because um we're seeing you know a huge change and hu many different uh, attacks on the church intellectually socially um migrationally with um with the church there's still a lot of people that support the church you know just like deism and just like the enlightenment and just like the scientific revolution it's really important for you all to understand it's not like everybody's becoming secular it's, no there's still many christians the church is, is still definitely a, 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 um, a powerful institution but we're seeing we, but we are seeing it be attacked um and, and that's important for us to know so don't just you know go to extremes uh uh, when um, you know writing about this or discussing this and thinking about this, so um, at the same time of this uh, huge stress for the church and Christians, uh, we're going to see lots of uh, missionary work, and we're going to talk more about that with imperialism. Uh, but there's a really unprecedented amount of Christian missionary work, uh, but it's important to understand that we're going to see, and this is what I want to focus on, is that we're going to see intellectual thought attack Christianity on three levels. We're going to see it historically, scientifically, and kind of philosophically and morally. Um, so let's talk about the first one historically. You know, writers are going to question Christianity on multiple levels. And, the, the, and their main criticism was that there was no evidence for certain things postulated in the Bible. There's, they, they, they are going to, you know, question Jesus, question some of the stories, Noah's Ark, question Moses and the Ten Commandments question things and as and cite that there's no evidence proving any of these things postulated in the Bible, um, and that's going to really uh, facilitate a loss of faith within Christianity and a loss of followers. As historians are simply saying, you know, prove it to the Bible, um, and that will definitely hurt them. David Strauss, he wrote uh, this text called The Life of Jesus, and he argued that the story of Jesus. It uh, was a myth that arose um, from conditions in you know the first century Holy Land, um, and you know we're gonna see other historians uh, kind of believe that the Bible is almost similar to the Iliad and the Odyssey, and, and that it was reflecting uh, you know the writings of the ancient Greeks, um, and simply the Bible you know was written by you know the ancient. Uh, you know, peoples of the Holy Land. Um, and so, you know, we're going to see that, that many people are going to believe that these are tales written by primitive humans, you know, long ago, you know, hundreds, thousands of years ago. Um, 
you know, science, on a scientific level, science is going to, you know, continue to attack Christianity and some of its narratives as well. Um, you know, geology is going to suggest that the uh, that the Earth was much older than stated in the Bible. As I said, Darwin and Wallace are going to challenge the creation of Earth. They're going to be, you know, putting forth this idea of natural selection that states that humans were not created by God but simply evolved. Um, so, so you're seeing the church, you know, be really put on the defensive from so many different levels. Uh, morally, you know, we're going to see, you know, many intellectuals crush, question the cruelty and sacrifices mentioned in the Bible and that, you know, that the, the cruelty of God and his unpredictability, did, did, you know, were ir irrational and did not, did not truly make sense. Um, you know, Nietzsche, who we'll discuss a little bit later, um, he felt that Christianity was weak. And um, he actually declared that God was dead. Um, we'll discuss him a little bit later. He, I read him in college, and he, he was quite an interesting individual. Um, but he felt that Christianity glorified weakness and was not, um, and rather than strength. Um, uh, and Nietzsche, um, in the, the very, you know, Bismarckian uh, idea and, and Bismarckian influence, he felt that war had done more for society than, you know, loving your neighbor or for the, than religion had. Um, and so we're seeing, you know, ladies and gentlemen, Christianity has lost some of its intellectual respectability. We're seeing a movement towards secularism. Um, we're going to see more, more and more um, secularism in urban areas. Uh, we're going to see fewer educated people join the clergy. We're going to see more people, more educated people join different areas. Um, and, you know, for the first time in in the world, we're going to see, you know, whole generations of people grow up with little or no religion. And we're going to see some people who would never go to church. And think about how far we've come, ladies and gentlemen. That's That was simply almost unheard of when we started this class in the in the late medieval ages. I mean, that was religion was everything to people. That's what they saw the world through. And now you're seeing, you know, whole populations of people never even going to church. I mean... Within a span of a few hundred years, look how, look how much has changed when it comes to our intellectual history. So that's quite profound. Now, at the same time, ladies and gentlemen, and this is something that we've talked about all the way from the beginning of our class, you know, going with Boniface and Philip the Fair, is we're going to continue to see our modern nation states attack um, religious institutions. And I mean, that is... That's where we started this class with Boniface, you know, Unan Sanctum, uh, he where he uh, announced that spiritual power was more important than um, temporal power. Think about think about that and how far we've come. Um, but we're going to see a huge conflict between church and state, ladies and gentlemen, during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, and we're going to see this on both a Catholic and Protestant level. Um, and the biggest conflict is going to be over education. Now, uh, you know, as far as and we can we can talk about this. Um, I could talk. We could teach a whole class on this. But um, you know, previously education, ladies and gentlemen, was very much religiously intertwined. You know, th and think about how important that was for religious institutions. Um, I hearken back to the Catholic Reformation, the Jesuits, right? How how did the, what, remember the Jesuits, Ignatius of Loyola, his spiritual exercises. Remember how important it was for him and the Catholics in order to kind of rebound from the Protestant Reformation, well, they targeted education as a way for them to get back in the game against the Protestants and in and, and establishing schools. And so education was very important for both Catholic and Protestants um, to perpetuate their own unique religions, right? Protestants, really important. They, they were one of the first religions to become literate and read the Bible because that was part of, the, that was part of their doctrine. Um, and so we, we're going to see, ladies and gentlemen, that religious institutions and some of our governments are going to have a tug of war over the power of who controls education. And churches feared uh, nations taking away education as new, um, you know, state schools may not have any religious teachings or education. And that was dangerous for them because, well, then they won't, the next generation will grow up, will grow up with little or no religion. They're it's going to, you know, result in less and less followers for them. Um, so in Great Britain, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to see Great Britain 
uh, provide for state-supported schools, and we've talked about the importance of compulsory education because of child labor laws, um, uh, and churches opposed improvements in uh, in government schools because, well, that that's going to hurt them. Um, and with the Education Act of 1902, and it's not like you guys need to memorize all this, what I want you to understand is the main concept is that we are seeing religion be attacked scientifically, historically, morally, and now we're going to see it attacked educationally. Um, and it's this idea that, you know, we're going to see with the Education Act of 1902 that state supports supported schools for religion, non-religious schools, but it imposes the same standards for each. And why that's important is because, you know, in religious schools, they're going to have the same standards as a non-religious school. So, for example, religious schools are going to have to teach a little math and science, and they might not like that because some of those ideas are going to definitely undermine, you know, some of the religious teachings that they may they may teach in their schools. So, you know, that 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 was very dangerous for them, and they definitely did not like that. They did not want to teach science. They did not want to teach evolution. They did not want to teach geology. Uh-uh. They, do they want to teach about heliocentrism? Not necessarily. Uh-uh. So... Those are, you know, that's that definitely going to uh, make them unhappy and put them on the defensive. In France, we're going to see, you know, the uh, the same thing. Um, we're going to see uh, as they go through, as the French, you know, develop their public school system, they are going to continue to separate church and state and, and uh, you know, separate the influence of religion from their educational system. Um, you know, and eventually we're going to see, you know, with uh, Ferry's reforms that, public schools and religious order, or excuse me, religious orders will not be allowed to teach in public schools um, during the 1800s. So the, the idea here, ladies and gentlemen, is that we are seeing a separation of church and state, the, the, the separation of religion from, um, from, from public education. The biggest example of this, ladies and gentlemen, is in Germany. Um, and this is going to be the uh, uh, one of the most extreme examples of um the separation of church and state and it's going to be with our guy obb um and this was called the culture conf uh the class of civilizations um and this is bismarck is going to team up with the liberals uh versus the catholic church in this and uh you know the liberals thought the catholic church was very backwards and represented you know the opposition of progress but bismarck was very suspicious of um their loyalty and did not want them to threaten his power um, and again, it's important to understand for us, you know, you all might be like, hey, but Harv, Germany, Prussia, Prussia's Protestant. Remember, Bismarck's united all of Germany. So the southern part of Germany is very Catholic, northern part of Germany, very Protestant. Bismarck is from Protestant Prussian, uh, Lutheran Prussian part. Um, he is going to be very, he's going to make sure that the, 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 um, Catholic, the Catholic Church does not have a lot of influence in that. Um, southern part of his new newly united German Reich. Um, so he's going to secularize education right when um, you know he's doing all of his unification. Um, and in his May laws of 1873, he's going to require priests to be educated in German schools and pass state examinations. He could veto appointments of priests, um, and the power of a state is transferred to the state over the Pope. Um, and this is really going to provoke a lot of Catholic resentment against the German state, but you know, Bismarck's no man to mess with. He's gonna he's gonna seize the property of disobedient clergy. He could stop their pay, exile them, put them in prison, and he's also at the same time gonna gain state control of education and the laws uh, concerning marriage, the laws concerning religion. Bismarck is definitely, you know, making it known to the Catholic Church, which has you know had a huge influence in in uh, the southern part of the Germany ever since the the Reformation. Um, Bismarck is making it known that he is in charge and that uh, he and you know the newly formed conservative German Empire is in charge of um, of religion and in charge of um, education and in charge of you know in charge of the government. All right, and here is a, f a very fascinating, famous picture of um, of this culture conflict. There you can see Bismarck. And the Catholic Church um, playing chess over who's in charge, um, but we know Bismarck's going to put them in a checkmate and um, and beat them. Now it's important to understand that we're going to see religious revivals all around in Europe due to this attack on Christianity. You're going to see we're going to see unprecedented missionary work in Africa and in Asia. 
um, as a church's response to um, to this rise in secularism on a historical, um, governmental, um, educational, um, moral, and historical level. Um, and this is going to really represent the last kind of final effort to truly Christianize Europe, but it's going to fail. Um, and so we are going to see, you know, Europe and the rest of the world, you know, move, continue to move towards secularism. And we're going to see our religious institutions con continue to, you know, weaken and be attacked um, as we progress. Um, now, I mean, it's important for us to understand that we, we've gone through this whole class talking about popes. We, you know, we've talked about um, Boniface and, the, and you know, where, we, where we started. And think about some of the major popes. Uh, as we've gone along, you don't, it's not like you need to memorize them all, ladies and gentlemen. But um, it's important to understand that you know the Catholic Church is still here today, so that's an, uh, important for us to acknowledge. Um, the uh, but think just think about that as we you study for your AP exam about the journey of the papacy, um, and we can we'll review that in class in a little bit. But you know, the the Pope is not going away. Um, we're gonna see uh, you know we talked about Pope Pius. The ninth, after Italian unification, he's going to be turned to be conservative. He's going to issue uh, the papacy is going to uh, become quite conservative after unification, after um, science, uh, after all these attacks that are really, um, you know, going on. And Pope Pius the uh, the ninth is going to issue the Syllabus of Errors, um, which is really going to set Christian doctrine against science, against philosophy, against politics, against the, this new modern educational system. Um, and it, he's going to state that the Roman Church does not have to come to terms with modern civilization. They don't have to change, and they don't want to change. And it's very, very similar to um, to uh, the Council of Trent, and very similar to them, you know, you know, in the face of Protestantism, saying, "Hey, we're going to get rid of the corruptions, but we are not going to change, you know, our philosophy and what we, you know, our doctrine and what we believe in." But he, Pope Pius IX, is saying, "Hey, we are not going to change." Um, and so we're going to see the the, uh, the first Vatican uh, Council will be summoned in the 1860s, um, and this this Pope Pius the Ninth is going to promote papal infill infallibility, very similar to what we've seen previously, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the Pope that he is that the Pope is incapable of error on issues of faith and morals, and those are things that we've talked about. Um, you know, he's going to assert uh, the importance of spiritual authority over a temporal and political authority. Um, but it's important to understand, ladies and gentlemen, the, you know, the church, think of how much it's shrunk. And remember, it's all started when Philip the Fair beat up Boniface. The, 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 the papacy has taken so many L's. It's, it's only limited to the Vatican in Italy. It doesn't have huge uh, sources of revenue anymore. It's losing its, in, uh, its educational influence um, with states controlling educa uh, education, you know, themselves. Um Science is really putting them on the defensive. History, um, you know, historians putting them on the defensive. You're having phil philosophers, I just outright question them. Secularism, urbanization, it it's tough. It's very tough, right? It's very tough for the, the uh, 19th century and 20th century Catholic Church. And we're seeing the Pope, um, you know, really having a hard time, the church having a hard time really come to terms with this modernity. Um, uh, Pope Leo uh, the thirteenth, Pius' successor, he he's going to be a moderate who defended religious uh, education uh, and a, a religious control of marriage, but he also wanted, um, you know, a corporate society based on more religious principles rather than socialist or capital ideals. Um, you know, he's going to issue these ideals in his Rerum Novarum. Um, we're going to see Pope Pius the tenth reject modernism, require all priests to take an anti-modernist oath, and you don't need to memorize all these, ladies and gentlemen. But the, the key here, ladies and gentlemen. That I want you to understand is the church has shrunk. It's lost so much of its power, um, and we we are really seeing the uh, where its final decline and where and kind of where it is um, where it is today. Um, Islam, like Christianity, ladies and gentlemen, is also going to see uh, and, and see some changes. Uh, it's going to start to be approached scientifically. We're going to see some anti-Islamic thought. Um, you know, within Europe, Islam was very much considered a religion incapable of developing scientific ideas. Um, we're going to see Europeans champion with social Darwinism, like the idea of social of social religion. You know, kind of play within that that there's a superior religion, and we're going to see Europeans really 
view that Christianity is uh, is a superior religion over uh, Islam. Um, you know, Christian missionaries are going to continue to reinforce many anti-Islamic attitudes, um, and you're going to see. We're going to talk a little bit more about this with the Ottomans, and you'll see this in World War after World War One. Um, and with uh, imperialism, but we're going to see Christian missionaries continue to set up schools and hospitals in the in the hopes of converting of converting Muslims. Um, and we'll see we'll see how how these educational systems will produce some of our um, important Arabs uh, who become uh, leaders in the Middle East after the fall of the Ottoman Empire. Um, uh, we'll see some Christian missionaries become sympathetic towards Muslims. Um, We'll also see this, the the uh, the Salafi movement, um, of where we see some Islamic uh, leaders who want to modernize Islam but reject you know Western uh, ideals such as the Enlightenment you know um, you know some of those uh, liberal liberal uh, ideologies that we talked about um, before. Um, uh, we're gonna see the Salafi movement really believe that the Arab world could modernize itself on the basis of a purely restored Islamic faith. Um, and and this is what we're getting at, and this is important because we're getting ready to talk about radical uh, Islam. We're going to start to talk about terrorism and where um, some of this, you know, orthodox Islam and this anti-West uh, rejection of the West, um, you know, uh, distrust of the West is really going to come from. And we're going to see how... Um, the Middle East is going to really shape in the, in the context of this changing dynamic within um, within Europe. Um, you know, and we're going to see you know many 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 uh, leaders, many movements to reject the West and modern thought rise. Um, and that's something that we're going to kind of harken on later as we close this class. So definitely, where we talk about things like nine eleven, um, the Persian Gulf Wars, the Afghanistan Wars, and kind of what's going on. With um, the Middle East in the context of Europe, but we're we're seeing we're going to see some um, Middle Eastern leaders and movements to really reject the West. All right, um, let's stop for here today, ladies and gentlemen, um, and we'll talk about art um, in class. I hope y'all are doing well. Um, please take notes.